All right, so good morning, everyone. Uh, this is um, following up of some aspects that the wall discussed earlier uh, this morning. That talk is about the positioning of Ada Core as far as cybersecurity goes. So you'll hear about some of the technologies that are available today for use off the shelf. Uh, some of them are already in your account. And we're also going to discuss elements of roadmap, things that we are investigating and for which uh, feedback would be quite useful. Okay, so let's have an overview of what cyber security is. And uh, th the first challenge that we are facing here is that security is really a system issue first and foremost. So when you look at the security of a given application, there are a lot of various places to consider, a lot of various places that can be subject to threats. Uh, the, the first one is definitely the user himself. I mean, we all know of that old joke of the manager that has the password on the sticker in the back of the screen. And, uh, you know, so that's the first thing to worry about. Um, but nowadays, those systems, more often than not, are highly connected. This is the generation of the IoT. Uh, and as a consequence, there are a lot of threats that can target the communication uh, layers. And, and there you would want to make sure that you have the encryption protocol properly set up and so on and so forth. There is an array of threats that target specifically the software itself, so as uh, com interconnected components. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, there are threats that are down to the very hardware level. Um, so, and of course, in, in this story, the uh, weakest link of the chain is the one that uh, you want to strengthen first. At AIDACOR, we have expertise on some of these things, and more specifically on the software aspect. So what I'm going to talk about is how we can help you to mitigate vulnerabilities uh, that pertain to the software component, all the while acknowledging the fact that uh, there are many other things to worry about when it comes to cybersecurity. So our tools really have uh, a multi-tier approach. This is somewhat similar to the kind of uh, structure you would look at if you were coming from the safety world. Uh, the first array of tools that we provide is with regards to static analysis. So the idea here is to be able to identify threats very early on in the process uh, and even before the testing phase and, and remove some of those. There are two categories of tools uh, in the static analysis that we provide. Uh, the first one is to find problems for you. And the second one is to guarantee that the source code is absent, is free of certain kind of problems. Okay? So code peer typically would cover the first uh, category of uh, check. Uh, let's assume that you have a couple of millions of lines of code coming from 20 plus years of history. Um, it is going to be very difficult to guarantee that you are completely free of certain things. But uh, we can look at the code and identify places where there are the most likely problems to occur. Okay? So Codepeer will essentially be a, a bug finder for that uh, purpose. If you are in a situation of developing new code, may that be a brand new application, or maybe more likely models, new modules on existing source code, our recommendation would definitely go to, to, to go with Spark, as was described uh, earlier today. Because if you develop using the Spark tool, so the, the language and uh, the static analysis that comes with it, uh, you will move from a world where you're looking for bugs to a world where you are guaranteeing that some problems aren't in your application by construction. So this is a much more uh, powerful demonstration, if you will. The flip side of the coin is that you really have to Consider that at the very early stages of the development, it's very difficult to retrofit uh, existing ADA code into Spark. So that's the first category of tools that are available. Of course, as always, for verification, you have the static analysis and dynamic analysis counterpart, or 
most uh, known as testing. And for that, the ADA language in itself, uh, this, this, yeah. the, the ADA language in itself provides a lot of capabilities. Uh, there are a lot of checks that you can enable. That most of them are actually there by default. And they will sort of um, crash the application or raise exceptions, if you will, uh, before hitting those vulnerabilities. It's not as good as static analysis in the sense that uh, you could still have attacks such as uh, denial of service through dynamic checks like that. But at least that can prevent some categories of problem to occur. Um, furthermore, we are developing or adopting, I should say, uh, more extensive testing methodologies, one that is known as fuzzing, which I will not talk too much about because we have a whole session of fuzzing uh, a little bit later this morning. And then maybe the newer component of what we're looking at, and this one is more research than um, uh, available off the shelf really, is this idea of hardening the compiler. Is this idea of generating different patterns of binary code in order to have code that is more robust to certain categories of attacks. So we're going to see at the high level all of these things uh, during this presentation. Okay, just uh, to mention and to piggyback on what Ben was saying, uh, we have a booklet over there, which is uh, the cybersecurity booklet, which will summarize a lot of the things that I'm going to describe today. Um, so there are a bunch of those, feel free to pick them up. If we happen to run out, we can send more. If you want more for your colleagues, we can send more as well. So uh, feel free to uh, uh, bring a version with you. Now, I'm going to talk a lot about this thing called CWE, which stands for Common Weaknesses and Liberation. Uh, which is, I mean, again, you've heard that uh, earlier this morning, it's just a, a list of potential problems that you might find in the application and that you should worry about. And a lot of our customers are asked to look at this list and to uh, explain how they mitigate the odds of having such vulnerability in the application. That specific document here uh, is a capability that was added in CodePeer about a year ago, I think, uh, which is a, a security report. And what it will do is it will look at the result of a CodePeer analysis and put that into a form of a CWE oriented report. It will tell you, look, you're using ADA. So all of these vulnerabilities you don't have then these are the ones that uh, we can find through CodePeer. These are the ones that we did not find in your code, and this is the ones, these are the ones that we actually found in your code. Um, if you're using CodePeer, you don't know about it already, that's, that's quite useful. This is something that you could just get out part of the output of the tool and then put into the proceedings that you might want to share with safety auditors or security auditors, for example. Um, that's, that's quite nice. Now, drilling down a bit on CWEs, uh, here's an example of things that you might have to consider, which pertains to input validation. Okay, so the idea is that you've got the software, you've got the out uh, outside world, and uh, there's interaction between the two. And the outside world is sending data, but this data might not be valid. And here you will see that we have a mix of dynamic and static mitigation methodologies that are available to you. Uh, again, the first one, ADA runtime checking, it has been there since the very early days of ADA. Uh, at least for the testing phase, it's quite useful to be able to detect that early on. Uh, of but there is an impact at runtime, so you might want to remove that uh, after production. You can go, with our technology, you can go beyond what the, the default checks provided by the language uh, establishes, if you will. The, Tick valid attributes uh, is an interesting one. If you do things like overlays, like you, you have a piece of data, uh, it has a range and whatever, but instead of initializing it, you say this data resides in this space in memory and I'm expecting it to be okay. Um, ADA will trust you 
and, may, and, and even if you do an explicit check, please verify that that value is still I, is in range. The compiler might optimize this value away. So tick valid is a way to force the compiler to recheck uh, certain things on, on the code that might uh, be believed to be true otherwise. Uh, and then with the GNAT compiler, you might be aware of the GNAT V family of switches, which is all about adding even more checks to the, the source code than uh, what is natively available with ADA. So you can really get belt and suspenders if you start to use these kind of switches, which is uh, during the testing uh, campaigns in particular can be quite uh, useful. It also could be seen as some kind of a hardening um, capability already if there are specific pieces of code that should absolutely fail if something goes wrong, maybe you could compile those with some of the things up there. Now of course, the issue is that this has um, a footprint in terms of execution, so uh, static mitigation may help removing some of those. The GNAT warnings by themselves uh, is a capability that has been there forever. We enhancing those every, every year, and this is kind of your first level of defense against uh, a number of vulnerabilities. And then you will see uh, the code P on Spark approaches that I've described before. Uh, so code PR, static analysis, and Spark Pro proof of checks being aimed at verifying all of these checks that would otherwise be added by the uh, ADA language. And with Spark, you can go again one step even further and start defining your own safety properties, a bit like those again that NVIDIA was describing earlier today, and verifying much more complex uh, properties on the source code. Okay. I'm skipping first testing. Again, you'll have a whole uh, session on that later on. Um, another vulnerability that uh, is interesting to consider is code injection. So you're already sort of lucky with ADA or because you're using a native language in the first place, you don't have the kind of eval function that Python or JavaScript have where you can self-compile or self-evaluate uh, expression as code. So that's already a bunch of those that um, are not around. You do static linking. You can execute the code from read-only memory. So there's all aspect of this specific vulnerability that doesn't apply in the first place. Uh, now, it's still possible to do code injection, of course, through the uh, infamous buffer overflow, where you manage to get the buffer to be written a bit beyond where it's supposed to be written, and maybe hack the return address uh, of the function to execute some code somewhere that was supposed to be data, and that's probably only the, the simple-minded explanation of that. Uh, you'll see that, interestingly, the way to mitigate that specific vulnerability happens to be the exact same way to mitigate the previous one. Because this is about buffer overflows, so if you have ways to uh, ensure that there are no buffer overflow in the first place, then this machine code injection gets a lot, a lot less likely. That's, I don't know, maybe 70, 80, 90 percent of the uh, security breaches we're hearing about those days are, are linked to this specific one that you can almost completely uh, get free of if you're using this kind of technique. Now this one is interesting, information leak. We're not talking about changing the behavior of the application so much more anymore. We, we're talking about trying to get access to uh, data that you're not supposed to get access to baseline. Um, a lot of this is overflow related. So again, same methodology, avoid before overflow through code peer stack and, and spark checking and so on and so forth. Um, that one is uh, more interesting, the cover channel vulnerabilities, and also known as side channel. And there's actually two things that you can consider for this one. Um, the first one is the bare data leakage that I was describing before. But think of this situation. I have a sub-program that is checking a password. So I'm decoding some password at some point, and I'm doing some computation on it. And I happen to store this password on the stack, because I have a local variable. Uh, do the check, I exit, and then that's it. I'm going to carry on my life. Well, what happens? When you exit a sub-program, you deep up the stack. That's SP minus 1, and that's it. The, the memory stays the way it was before. So all of a sudden, without knowing, you leaked the password onto the memory of the system. 
and an attacker from somewhere else could then hack it and, and, and read it and, and then retrieve that password. Uh, another very well-known example is the so-called uh, timing attack. Uh, if you look at the password decryption, for example, just to keep the same example, it might be the case that the way the algorithm is developed, the shorter it takes, the closer you are to the actual password. So you could just randomly try stuff if you have access to the device, let's say, and you have the liberty to try things a lot. And just by listening to how much time it takes to get the answer, no, this is the wrong password, you can sort of heuristically close down to the actual right answer. Um, so that's the kind of this aspect of vulnerability. Uh, the other one is, I think, even more crazy than, than this. Uh, let's get back to that password case. So you decode the password, the password is great, it is the one that you expect. So somewhere you have something that says, is, if password is correct, then do secure application, the secure operation, right? So you have one instruction effectively in, in the whole binary that is conditioned by the password correctness. Well, if you have access to the hardware, you can glitch by uh, injecting some tension or whatnot and glitch that very instruction to be skipped. And all of a sudden, you know, there's no problem. Do, you don't even need to know the password or to try to learn the password. You can just glitch the binary instruction that is doing the check. And here you go, you have full access to the system. In the typical military application, that might be a weird case to consider because the attacker typically doesn't have access to um, the hardware so well. Although it's been known that uh, sometimes military equipment is lost in uh, foreign or enemy territories, and in that case, you know, people could have access to it and try to access to secrets that are not supposed to be available to them uh, through those techniques. Uh, in the commercial world, this is ubiquitous. You know, you think of companies such as Nvidia, Intel, Apple, like people that send millions and millions of devices out there uh, and that have secrets such as DRMs. Uh, you could imagine that hackers have all the leisure to try to attack those systems and to skip or, or glitch or read the memory or do any of these things. So how do we protect the, uh, the code against that? So that's where this idea of compiler hardening comes into play. Uh, so one thing that we could do for this first category, the data leakage, one very simple idea is to say, how about erasing the memory when you exit the stack? Well, of course, we're back to the world of um, footprint at runtime, so you don't want to do that all over the place. You want to be able to select maybe specific types or specific function that will do uh, this kind of operations. Uh, and then the, the other aspect is, hey, uh, the stack is one thing, but what if some of these data leaked into registers? You know, so there's all kind of things to consider to be able to do that, uh, or in the cache of the processor, and so on and so forth. So it, it's, there's all kind of things to worry about, but we could develop tools at compilation level to automatically generate code that takes care of all of that for you. Um, for the timing attack, you know how when you do a, a comparison in ADA between a string and another string and it will uh, go as long as the two characters are the same and the minute it finds a difference, it stops. So that means that essentially, um, how does it go? The more equal the string are, the longer the comparison go. So you could ask the compiler to develop um, constant time comparisons for these kind of things. So you could also uh, try to remove the exit statement you know, of, of, of your loops so that the for loop always takes the same time, and so on and so forth. Um, another idea is when you write sensitive memory, instead of writing it always at the same place, have some kind of randomization to make sure that it always gets written at a different place, which makes an, an attack harder. So that's for this category. For the other category, well, I've said that it is possible to have the capability to just skip uh, a, a given test if password is correct. Uh, the first idea to uh, avoid that is to duplicate it. Let's, let's have the compiler duplicating every test to make sure that 
uh, it gets the same result twice. All of a sudden, you have to glitch not one, but two instructions. Hey, let's get even more crazy. Let's add some randomness before that so that that particular instruction will not always happen at the same time in the program. Um, you could even get more in depth and you know, look at the path that the application is taking and verify that uh, the, the control flow that you get is the control flow that you expect and so on and so forth. So there's an array of methodology. Here's a paper uh, at the bottom from Ambekasm that describes a lot of those. All of these things that could be done uh, just at the compile level to an array of pragma or switches and things like that. This is all very research at this stage. We don't have off the shelf stuff available. And as you can see, there is an amongst amount of things that we could be doing. Uh, it's sometimes difficult to identify which ones are useful and you know, which ones are just uh, interesting researchy things that could not find uh, applications. So for, for those, um, we would benefit a lot from feedback. So if this is things that rings a bell to you guys. Let us know so that we know what to concentrate on. So here are some scenarios where we find security with our tools to be uh, useful. The first one, by far the most common in our uh, user base, is I have a large amount of code. I'm now asked to do something about security on it. What do I do? And here, uh, the answer, for example, is code peer, which will look for the most interesting potential issues in the code and then drive uh, corrective measure on your end. The second and the third scenario are kind of related. The idea is for new code to pre-establish safe development methodologies. Um, so the, the scenario two is that you're just doing that with Ada, but quite frankly, if you are writing new code today, our recommendation, our very strong recommendation is to uh, go straight to, to Spark, and then we could have the, the fourth scenario where you develop some aspect of the software using Spark or similar um, highly enforceable standards and some aspect of the application with Ada, C, or C++. Uh, I want to emphasize the scenario three here. You, you might have heard that there are a lot of people that are starting to use Ada for the first time those days. This is a new phenomenon that uh, we could not quite measure uh, five years ago. This is something that we noticed. Uh, and of course, NVIDIA is one of the most notable example of, of this behavior, this trend, but that's far from being uh, the only case. All of these people that start to use Ada for the first time actually are adopting Spark and Ada together, and just not Ada. Okay. So um, fortunately, on scenario three, we have some references that you can check out on the web with the corresponding code available so that you can see what that might look like. Uh, one interesting one is uh, the so-called MUEN, which is a separation kernel. So it's, it's, a, it's a system that you put on a workstation and that will be able to run different application, one in isolation of the other. It's fully developed in Spark, it's fully open source. You can go to muencodelabs.sh. Codelabs is the company that is trying, or has started to provide commercial support on it. Uh, so waste use case, it's on x86 today. Uh, they are migrating it to ARM, I believe, as we speak. Uh, a second one that, uh, could be of interest is the so-called Wookie, uh, which is a demonstrator of a secure USB stick entirely developed in Spark. Now this one is interesting because they talk about the pre-project study when they considered various different languages to implement that USB key firmware, and at the end of their study they did select uh, Ada and Spark, and again, uh, the paper, the source code, and everything is available on GitHub. Uh, so this is a very uh, good piece to study and look at what that might actually look like. So a few take-home messages, if you will, to uh, get out of this presentation. Uh, there is a lot of benefits. There are a lot of benefits by using Ada and Spark to help with cybersecurity. A lot of things that can be deployed uh, already today, depending on your situation. Um, and we have tools that come to sustain those processes. 
Uh, I can't emphasize enough the fact that if you are developing new code, even new modules within existing code, it's really worthwhile uh, checking out the Spark Pro capability for those. And our own roadmap includes a lot of things that we could be doing. I've described some of those. Uh, you see here, I'm talking also about taint analysis or secure libraries and so on and so forth. Uh, with a little bit of help to identify what is the most useful, what is the most proximate uh, from you guys to make sure that we do the more interesting things initially. And that's all for me. Thank you very much.